Hello and welcome. My name is Chloe Swibelo and I'm Reba's Public Programs Manager and I'm really happy to be welcoming you all to the sixth event in our talk series, Architecture Anew. I cannot wait for tonight's conversation. I have been looking forward to it since confirming our speakers months and months ago now. So tonight we will hear how climate justice intersects with feminism under the term ecofeminism, with a specific focus on how architects can relate to this topic through co-housing. I will happily admit that ecofeminism was a new field for me um, that I discovered when researching for this talk series, but it is one that is at the heart of what Architecture New has always set out to do, namely to expand contemporary debate on the topic of sustainability to holistically embrace its social and economic concerns alongside environmental ones. Architecture New is part of our ongoing partnership with Richard Bathrooms, and I would like to thank Richard Bathrooms for sponsoring this important series. Shortly, I will hand over to our brilliant co-chairs for this evening, but just before I do, I wanted to give a, a brief housekeeping overview of the talks platform Hopin that we're using today to ensure that everyone can get the most out of it. So bear with me, there's some information here. You should all be able to see a chat and the Q&A box somewhere near this video stream. For those on computers, it will be to the right of the video, but for those joining on other devices, it might look a bit different. Please do say hello and share your comments or experiences with um, uh, this topic and any thoughts on the presentations in the chat if you'd like to. We know for some chat boxes can be a bit distracting, so if that's you, feel free to maximize this stream now with one of the toggles in the bottom of the video to avoid seeing any comments. Another setting to mention that can be found by hovering over the bottom of the video um, can help you to adjust the quality of the stream. So Hopin was automatically streaming to its highest quality HD setting right now. So if your feed is a bit pixelated or a bit glitchy, you can try one of the lower resolution settings, which actually will be better quality for you if your internet connection isn't as strong. If anyone experiences this and needs a bit of help from us, you can use the chat to let us know and someone's on hand to guide you through it. Towards the end, we're gonna try a couple of live audience Q&As, and I mean webcams and all. So please submit your questions for this via the Q&A box for a chance to, um, to do this. Backstage, I'll be um, contacting a number of those who've submitted questions, and I'll get in touch with you directly um, to take you through to our backstage area where you'll join the speakers. If you've submitted a question that you want to ask live, please try to check your direct messages and hop in where you'll see my message. So you will see this as a red notification in the top right of your screen over a paper airplane, which looks a little bit like Instagram DMs. Please bear with us when we get to the Q&As, but we hope to keep it as smooth as possible. After tonight's talk, you can also join our networking feature. Um, for those on desktops, you can see that's the left hand side of the screen now. For those joining, it will be a bit like speed dating. So you'll be matched up randomly with another member of the audience um, for about three minutes. And if you're enjoying each other's company, you can always extend that. This will be open for 30 minutes after the talk ends. So I do encourage everyone to try that out. The last feature to point out is the info zone, again, to the left-hand side. And this provides some further information on where you can find recordings of previous events in this series, and also a chance to chat to our sponsors. So that was a lot of information, but hopefully it will help some of you and get the most of tonight's platform, um, talk on Hopin. Um, but now I'm going to uh, hand over to Sheridan McGregor and Nidavai Thomas, who will now take over as co-chairs for the event. I feel incredibly lucky to have both Sheridan and Nidavai here tonight, as they are genuinely two of the foremost experts in this area. Sheridan is an academic base at the University of Manchester. Her research explores the connections between environmental problems and social inequalities with a focus on strategies for achieving just, inclusive and sustainable societies. She's been working on the feminist Green New Deal for the UK, and I'm really looking forward to seeing where that gets to. It's an important uh, project to ensure gender and racial equality are at the heart of plans to tackle the climate crisis. Lidavai is a consulting engineer and researcher who has published widely on co-housing and gender perspectives in spatial planning and architecture. Lidavai founded the architecture studio Tussen Rumta in Rotterdam in 1999, which specializes in sustainable building and renovation. So without further ado, Sheridan and Nidavai, I'm handing over to you both now. Hello, everybody. Oh, thanks very much, Chloe, for that introduction. Um, and I'm going to share my slides. And while I do that, let me also say um, that um, the format for the event is that uh, Lidavai and I will um, will um sorry panic i can't find my slides 
<laughs> well, you sh share the slides, Sherilyn. I can introduce the format. Okay. The format, yes. Yes, we're uh, the both of us will introduce the issue of co-housing and uh, eco-feminism for you. Um, and we're supposed to talk about 15 minutes. I'm not sure we'll manage because there's so much to say, um, but we'll try. And then uh, we will hand over to Meredith and Francis, an architect and a resident of co-housing, who will present their um, their project Marmalade Lane to us again. 15 to 20 minutes and then we'll all get together uh, the four of us uh, and we'll try to uh, answer some questions Sherilyn. Right now can you see the slides? Yes we can. Excellent okay thanks Lidavai. We knew that might be a bit of clunky at the beginning but anyway here we are and as Lidavai said we are going to start by talking about this question of whether co-housing is an eco-feminist model for architecture and Spoiler alert, you probably can tell that our answer to that is yes. Um, but in order to try and convince you of that, we want to go through some other questions first. And briefly, these are what is ecofeminism? How does it relate to architecture? What is co housing? And how does co housing integrate feminist and ecological goals? And then we'll end with some questions for discussion. And these are just some questions that. Lidavai and I have been working on for a number of years in our collaboration. Uh, we hope they will inspire a fruitful conversation and we're very keen to hear the perspectives of Meredith and Francis on these questions as well as those of you in the audience who have an interest in the topic. So to start off, even before we talk about co-housing, what is ecofeminism and how does it relate to architecture? Well, ecofeminism, don't be afraid. It's not as scary as it might sound. Um, it's not new. It's been around for at least 40 years or so. And in a nutshell, it is um, a, a perspective that tries to integrate two goals from um, the political movements of environmentalism and feminism. Um, and you will know that the core goals of environmentalism, which is ecological sustainability, is about the equitable distribution of resources within communities and across generations. A core goal of feminism is gender justice, and this is about addressing inequalities in power, wealth, status, res and responsibility between men and women. And ecofeminism seeks to integrate these goals, not only because they're important in themselves, but also because environmentalism on its own has tended to ignore or take for granted gender differences and gender concerns. And feminism on its own has tended to overlook the fact that demands for gender equality are being made on a finite planet. So ecofeminism is a, a theory of socio-ecological change that I like to say is both critical and visionary. It's critical in that it analyzes the root causes of inequality and unsustainability as being interconnected. They're interconnected in the key features of capitalist societies. And chief among these are privatization and the devaluation and exploitation of things that we don't monetize, that we don't put a money value to. So human forms of human labor, such as caring and ecosystem services. It's also visionary, a visionary perspective, in that it proposes ways of living that minimize human-induced harm to the environment and might increase ethical and caring relationships between humans and between humans and the natural world. And care here really is key. So it's not just an ethic or a sentiment, but it's also the work of care, the taking care of people's needs, tending to the land and, and living things, and making spaces livable. Uh, and the view here is that this work of care is feminized. Um, it's essential to our survival and to sustainability, but it's also taken for granted, often underpaid and unpaid. And in most societies, this means that it, it's a, dr a key driver of gender inequality. So putting ecofeminist theory into practice means putting strategies for transforming care relations at the center of green policies for a just transition. We might say that in addition to the environmentalist mantra of going beyond business as usual, ecofeminists also say that we mustn't settle for caring as usual if we are going to create just and sustainable societies. 
So ecofeminism is a perspective that is shaping um, international and national climate politics, in part due to its articulation of the concept of climate justice and the concept of a just transition. And this is being advocated at, uh, very widely at, all the way from the United Nations in, uh, level into the streets. Um, and one way of thinking about it is that transition to a low carbon society is inevitable. Uh, in many ways, inevitable technologically. But whether or not this transition is going to be socially just is up for grabs. It's going to require activism. And ecofeminists are particularly worried that the lack of women involved in making decisions and policies for tackling the climate emergency will mean that gender justice is not embedded in them. So this brings us to how ecofeminism relates to architecture, housing, and the built environment. Now, we might not hear a lot of talk or a lot of slogans about architecture and planning in climate justice movements, but there's a long tradition within ecofeminist circles of considering built environments. And these are just three uh, book covers um, to give you a, a bit of a flavor, and there's not enough time to go through all of the, the, the important and rich work that's been done in this field. But these three uh, are just representative and, and they're, they're work that have uh, influenced our thinking. Um, and at the, at the sort of common denominator is that this work tries to explain how humans have shaped their, their settlements and their surroundings in ways that reflect dominant values and power relations. Our built environments have locked us into certain relationships and practices that we now know are contrary to both equality and sustainability. So Dolores Hayden's work on the Grand Domestic Revolution, among other books, um, has focused on the problem of the domestic sphere and the problem that the modern private home has been designed to need a lot of maintenance and housework and also to be filled up with lots of stuff appliances and so forth. And this is not good for either women or for the planet. And what is needed, she argued, from a feminist perspective, is to create supportive communities and spaces uh, that support women's roles as members of families and uh, workers in the paid labor force. Many of you will have already already know about Matrix, which is a, which was a feminist design cooperative from the the 80s and 90s in London, and they were responding to the problem that the built environment was predominantly modeled uh, on the needs and experiences of a, of a of one social group, i.e., men. Um, that it was literally a man-made environment and matrix architects and, and, and other professionals were involved in trying to make the, the whole profession much more inclusive of marginalized concerns and particularly to bring women into the profession. Federici, Silvia Federici, is an, is, she's not an architect. She doesn't write necessarily about architecture, but she offers an economic analysis of the role of privatization and enclosure of the commons which is central to capitalism, but it's also central to creating the social and ecological problems of the 20th and 21st centuries. So the enclosure of common land, which, would, which has led to the exhaustion of natural resources, such as soil, and the enclosure, quite literally, of people into exclusive uh, groupings called nuclear families uh, and private single family dwellings, that has ended up creating a gender division of roles, um, which since the 20th century, at least, has brought about an exhausting double day of paid and unpaid work for many women and has, for, for some people, create, led to a private home, be, having been experienced as places of drudgery, loneliness, uh, stress and violence. So Federici's work is really interesting because it's in, now inspiring a new commoning movement which is about reversing privatization and enclosure. And she makes the argument that commoning, which involves all forms of sharing and collectivization, is inherently an eco-feminist project. So feminists have always wanted to think critically about the private spaces that we live in and to create better environments for women. And eco-feminists take this a step further to show that better houses and cities for women will also have lower impacts on the environment and on our planet. And co-housing is part of this history. In fact, many have argued that co-housing is designed for gender equality. For example, Vest Vestbro and Horelli have written a history of co-housing. And this framing and the, their use of this image um, of Hemgarden in Sweden from the earliest, earliest, early 20th century 
um, really sort of shows the idea that collectivizing spaces um, can help to liberate women from domestic drudgery. So in this case, by getting rid of the private kitchen and having centralized kitchens, bakeries, and other collective services. But this analysis um, and others like uh, Vespra and Herales has have been debated uh, and many more questions remain, which is why it is such an interesting um, subject of study. And I've been really privileged to be able to discuss and to learn about the complexity of, of co-housing from Lidovai, who is an internationally known expert on co-housing in Europe. So I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to Lidovai now to take over. Thank you very much, uh, Sherilyn. Indeed, um, the project of Alra Meerdal and also the project that we're looking at now, um, it, does it represent co-housing? Um, that's a very interesting question also from an architectural point of view. Um, it, what it does show is that the criticism of women on the lack of accommodation for other than nuclear bed, uh, winner family households is far from new. And since before the architectural schools even existed, women's organizations have been developing proposals for housing single professional women, for example. So the building that we are looking at now is uh, one of those buildings and it's uh, small flats uh, on the top floors and serviced by professional uh, domestic services such as meals, uh, library, laundry, cleaning, hairdresser and so on. Um, in Rotterdam. But this building took 20 years to be uh, realized. It had to wait for building permission because in the post-war period, um, housing for the so-called complete families, uh, that includes a mother, a father and children, had uh, a priority. So is this model, uh, if we go to the next uh, slide, is this model uh, the same kind of co-housing uh, that we see uh, re-emerging in, in current times. Um, what, is, uh, what they have in common is that these ideas have generated architectural innovation. Um, and this idea of surfaced housing with uh, collectivized and professionalized um, domestic services are regaining momentum across Europe. We can see, uh, for example, the Catalan um, architect office that promotes the kitchenless uh, city, where uh, the, uh, many domestic services are being outsourced um, as a new housing model. Uh, and we can see the Nordic Pavilion in the um, uh, this year's Venice Biennale that uh, also shows a model for uh, co-housing um, based on uh, this concept of the sharing economy. Next, please. Um, if we talk about the sharing economy, what are we talking about? Um, sharing can be immaterial. Right? You get together with a group of uh, similar ideas or values or competences around a certain activity or a certain uh, idea to eat uh, um, uh, ecologically or produce food ecologically or uh, something. But then you have to get together. You have to dedicate also time and uh, activities. So that's the immaterial uh, component of sharing. Um, it also has a clear material component. Um, you share spaces that can be outdoors, such as playgrounds or gardens, and it can be indoors uh, for cooking, uh, for laundry uh, and so on. And uh, you can share obje objects such as uh, uh, washing machines or uh, lawn mowers or uh, bicycle uh, for children in, in this case, in this picture here and so on. And all these, um, all these forms of sharing are closely related to dwelling, which we do in our uh, homes. Um, only the single family unit is not very well equipped for this kind of uh, sharing. Next, um, the management uh, of the individual house, including all the services like water, sanitation, heating, ventilation, and cooling, um, puts considerable pressure on household time and on the financial budget. First, you have to pay for all this machiner machinery, and then you have to pay the bills. And then finally, I mean, how often have you had to wait at home for a technical support 
after a breakdown of your washing machine or a breakdown of your or heating uh, and so on. So it's no wonder uh, that this sharing economy um, tries to find alternatives. Next, please. Um, and it, the, the, the housing mod model that they are developing um, is characterized by something that sounds a little bit old fashioned. And let's create a village in town. But in reality, the concept that we are seeing or I should say the concepts that we are seeing are very modern and they make use of new technologies that address climate change. Um, and they try to find innovative models for affordability, uh, diversity, diverse housing types, and uh, also to support aging. And they do this in not in a sectoral way, so they don't address each of these issues in a separate way, but in an integrated way. And I want to illustrate that with a couple of uh, examples. First one is uh, from the Netherlands, uh, typically Dutch appearance. Uh, and what you see is a modular, modular building technology that allows for variation, uh, but in a cost effective way. This project is mixed tenure, so you can rent or you can be a homeowner. And it includes several shared spaces, uh, such as a garden or a co-working office. And by creating this project together, the residents are not anonymous um, and it becomes much easier to exchange neighborly services like uh, cat sitting or uh, driving your children to sports or whatever. Uh, but also it becomes more easy to resolve neighborly conflicts like uh, who has uh, put the litter on the playground and so on. So next one. Um, what these kind of projects are, are trying to do is based on common values and through acting together, so sharing values and time, create new transformative models for all kinds of uh, aspects involved in housing. The decision-making processes involved in making design choices or technical choices um, to create conviviality, um, to innovate uh, financial models, to co-finance and to share uh, the, the financial burden in different ways. And not uh, in the least important to reduce the environmental impact from the energy, water and waste flows uh, that such a housing project involves. The next example is from uh, France, uh, for example. And here the emphasis is on creating community and integrate uh, living together with different generations and different household types. It, its layout is organized in a way that the corridors serve as meeting places. Um, but in addition, there are some shared rooms and gardens which are used for participating in the, uh, the running and the maintenance of the project and also for educational activities. Sometimes, as the next example shows, um, there is not a mix of uh, residents, but it's um, a very specific group. And this project was created because in Europe, uh, women have lower salaries most of the time and this lower pensions than men. And on the other hand, they live longer statistically. So their access to, or our access, I can say, uh, to the housing market is more difficult. And these senior women in London got together to create a project for aging together. So they are taking control over their living conditions and they are reducing the risk of isolation when they start to become less agile and less mobile uh, during age. Another project from the UK has more the emphasis on sustainability so that they put their ecological footprint on the uh, foreground. And they created some common installations uh, however, they still use individual heating for the houses. But for example, they use photovoltaic to make electricity and the residents can see how much electricity is being produced at any particular time. So they can use the common washing machines, for example, or the lawnmower mower at that time and then benefit from the uh, free 
uh, electricity and thus reduce the costs of their uh, household. So all in all, um, and the next project uh, shows that again very well, um, the new generation of projects that is arising is really able to take affordability and sustainability together one step further. So what we're looking at now are two projects with social housing, shared technology, shared spaces, shared mobility, um, but everyone still has also a private unit uh, to withdraw in. So they use these spaces also to take this sharing one step further. Uh, for example, using it uh, for uh, offices for co-working or uh, creating a food co-op. Um, so uh, again, they are uh, developing activities and practices that reduce the ecological footprint um, and uh, create a kind of a specific kind of commons. Now, we can be very enthusiastic about this model, um, but um, there are also some questions to be asked. Um, ultimately, uh, if we see all this commoning, um, what happens to uh, all this work that needs to be done, and which is also unpaid work, to organize the project, to care for uh, each other, to care for the uh, common spaces? And who will do this voluntary work? And if it means that this care work by being professionalized and being upgraded and being shared has better conditions, does that mean that it will also be divided more, in, more equally between different uh, genders, the different ages? Uh, the, the, will it be divided equally between the residents of a project? How does this negotiation take place? Does it improve really women's access to the labor market? Um, on the one hand, it takes more time to be involved in such a project, but on the other hand, you can also rely on your neighbors, uh, for example, to keep an eye on your children when you're running late in, uh, in your work, in your service or wherever you work. Does it mean that women can have a room of their own and can escape from social pressure that uh, communities also represent and the expectations that go with uh, being a woman. So community is, sounds like a very cuddly word, but mm -hmm. who cleans the commons, Sherilyn? <laughs> That's right, who cleans the commons? And so this brings us to, just by way of coming to our final question is how does co-housing enable this integration of feminist and ecological goals or does co-housing enable it? Um, you know, so far we've shown how it might and we think there's a lot of promise. Here's a quote from an article that we wrote um, that's to say that um, contemporary co-housing promises to be an alternative model that promotes equality by breaking with the patriarchal capitalist enclosure of the domestic sphere and it challenges the assumption that people want to live only with people to whom they are re related by birth or marriage, and that sharing of space and stuff is neither practical nor desirable. So there's a promise here, but that promise of integration needs more work and of course more research before we can say that it is being realized. And we, in our article, argue that we need to get beyond wishful thinking about co-housing and to look critically um, and how at, at actually existing co-housing and how it has evolved over time and in different contexts. So we can list all the reasons why in theory, co-housing is an eco-feminist model. We also think that in, that reality comes down to how people inhabit these places. And sometimes they might be more interested in the green tech and the energy saving than on how they might rearrange their uh, everyday lives. And it, by the same token, just because there are common spaces doesn't necessarily need to lead to commoning as a practice or reversing deeply entrenched cultural uh, and uh, values and assumptions. So we think that you know there's lots of work to be done. And, and we this is just a little anecdote very quickly. Uh, when Lydia and I were traveling around looking at some examples of co-housing for our research, we went to a, a, a co-housing project so I won't say where, in, in England. And it was in a, built in this grand house and they were working together to develop um, a shared 
uh, living arrangement and uh, we walked around and said, well, my, this is a very grand open plan uh, foyer with a big, huge staircase. This is not the actual picture, um, but um, thought, well, this must take a lot of work to, to clean and keep the cobwebs at bay. Um, and we sort of were humming, asking that to ourselves. And we saw a man who's part of the project come by and we said to him, do you, so do you collectively discuss how you're going to get, do the cleaning? And do you have a, a rota? And he just looked at us in absolute puzzlement and said, oh no, it just seems to get done. So I think that's a kind of interesting little um, reminder that just because co-housing has a promise, it doesn't necessarily lead to change in reality. So what we want to say just by way of getting to the end and getting to our questions is that we might want to think about co-housing in a larger context of thinking about a caring city and thinking about re, uh, re reconfiguring um, urban planning and our public infrastructure to allow for uh, a, a more, much more caring type of community. So thinking about care infrastructure is a, a central concern for a lot of uh, uh, eco-feminists who are working on such things as a Green New Deal. Um, and this project from Barcelona, why Blanca Valdivia is also thinking about how we can put, uh, provide a care, uh, a care infrastructure public services, redistributing the essential work of care and creating a culture where care work is seen as work that everyone must do. And there's no passes out of doing caring work based on your privilege or your gender. Um, and and you know, this is getting a lot of interest in, for example, in, in the USA with Biden's uh, infrastructure plan. And as I said, the Green New Deal. So the so Again, co-housing can't do it all. It needs to be part of a, a, a bigger package. But this brings us to our questions for discussion. And before we turn it over to people who have been on at the, you know, at the front lines of, of, of developing and living in co-housing, questions for them and questions for the audience is, first of all, ambition and reality. To what extent do actually existing co-housing developments succeed in putting feminist and ecological goals into practice? Secondly, transformation and regulation. What is the role of the architect in designing these new housing models? How do they overcome some of the regulatory barriers to creating some of these radical types of uh, ways of living? And finally, inclusivity and justice. Um, is co-housing accessible for everyone? If it's a if it's a, a, a model for, for eco-feminist social change, it has to be accessible to everyone, not just the exclusive a uh, few who have the, the means, the wealth and the social capital to be able to be involved. So those are just our questions. And I will now um, introduce um, to, uh, our next speakers um, to uh, present their uh, experiences. The first speaker is Francis Wright from town. Uh, and Francis is um, a resident of Marmalade Lane uh, which is the home of Cambridge co-housing community. And Meredith now works um, as head of community partnering with the enabling developer uh, called Town. And Meredith Bowles is director of Mole Architects, um, which is one of um, the leading architectural practices in the UK, um, recognized uh, for his leadership skills and advocacy of design excellence. He's has a long um, history of working with Reba, uh, has taught architecture extensively, uh, and currently is visiting professor of architecture at the University of Suffolk. So over to Francis first, please. Thank you. Let me just uh, share my screen. is now working. Excellent. And I apologies, we practiced well, and then it, it hasn't performed on the day, so I can't get rid of the um, edges. So thank you, Sherilyn. And I'm, I'm going to take everybody through, really just to sort of set the scene for the conversations we're going to have, Marmalade Lane, which is a co-housing community in Cambridge that was established in 2000 and 18 December so quite late in 2018 and after I've done that Meredith is going to carry on and talk about the process that he was involved in with the co-housing group as the architect so 
if I can move down. So these are the co-housing principles that from a UK co-housing network perspective, we use to describe co-housing. And I think they're, they're broadly similar to those that we've already seen in the presentation before me, but there's, there's probably some nuances. And what's noticeably missing are the um, principles around sustainability and affordability. They're not there. And, um, and while most groups probably share those ambitions, uh, they're not the criteria that are, are being used to define what is and isn't co-housing in the UK. And of course, in practice, what is achievable is often very context specific. So this is the context for Marmalade Lane. It's an urban fringe development right at the edge of Cambridge, bounded by the A14 and a quite significant ring road called King Hedges Road. And um, it, that urban fringe development probably has around a thousand homes in it. And it's about two miles out from the city centre. And this image is a close up and it really enables me to talk about some of those key features in co-housing, which we've seen diagrammatically in the presentation before. You can see uh, there's one building there with a chimney that is the common house, the shared internal space. And then uh, the emphasis is on that shared communal garden, although everyone has their own private outdoor spaces as well. They're really quite small to emphasize that space. And there's a car free lane called Marmalade Lane that is enabled by really moving cars to the side of the community. And that is a very common feature in co-housing communities. And um, and this is really just to illustrate that point that co-housing communities are emphasizing sociability, the um, having shared space for collaboration. And as a consequence, one of the ways that that is achieved is by the treatment of cars. And this is the an image showing the neighboring plot in Orchard Park, um, broadly similar in size. And the blue is highlighting where cars are feature and the consequences of that. And here I've just got a few images showing some of these key features. This is the car free lane that really has been designed to be suitable for play and for socialization. And you can see on the left hand side that is a, those are the backs of houses uh, where that, uh, that sort of desire for sociability has informed the boundary treatments to those houses. And then here is an image of the shared garden. In the foreground is the growing, growing space. And then in the middle ground, you can see um, what was uh, a sort of fairly old hedgerow has grown up and matured and, and is a wild space in the garden. And then uh, we've been nurturing the rest as a wildflower meadow. And this is an image of one of the rooms in the common house used for community meals and um, and just leisure activity. And then we're now in a series of pictures, which I'm going to go through fairly quickly, really, to give us lots of time for discussion. But these are personal um, images, and I hope will just give enable me to just give a flavour of living in in the community. So uh, on the left is a notice board for residents just flagging up key activities. And you can see in that particular week when I took the photo, there's a blend from uh, social activity with a party through to our effectively our board meeting, um, through to a work activity and eating. And those four elements really make up the life of the community. And on the right is uh, the the sort of um, the mound, the growing mound, it's unfinished in this picture and is capturing that sense of shared endeavor around creating a shared space and tailoring it to meet 
the needs of the moment. And here, this mound is a result of, it's on car parking spaces that aren't used as car parking spaces now. Um, it is the byproduct of us planting um, 13 mature trees last winter, and it's on the way to being a children's play area with a slide. So it's work in progress and a big um, endeavor for the community. And it also has the byproduct of a sunken trampoline as well. Um, I talked about eating. Um, that probably happens once or twice a week and there's an opportunity for people to come together. It's not compulsory. Some of them are um, formal, sort of more formal meals and sometimes it's just celebrating a birthday together and cake. There's lots of cake living in a community. Um, and you can see actually in the right hand image, lots of coats and hats. It's winter time. Um, but community meals are continuing outside. And this is just to pick up again the, the importance, I suppose, of the kind of um, meaningful activity that bring people together in a community context. And here on the left is the planting of the trees. Um, just behind it, you can see the straw bale surround that enable people to continue to spend time together during a COVID winter, um, but a little, tiny bit sheltered from the wind. And then on the right hand side is the monthly litter pick around Orchard Park that many members of the community and people living nearby participate in. And then um, this last image is picking up that theme about how in a community context, spaces change and respond to people's needs and interests. And on the right is uh, prosaically named the Long Room and it now has our food, effectively a food co-op, it's, it's our internal shop. And um, one of the original uh, desires behind it was to re help us reduce food waste and, and other waste. And on the right hand side I, are some development hoardings where um, one of our residents um, has had a lifelong ambition to paint a mural and she got that opportunity uh, and uh, over some months with the support of other residents painted a mural of wildlife that features in Orchard Park. And then um, these two capture something about sustainable living in the community. Um, I think some of the features of sustainability come as people inhabit a place and um, on the right is the shared electric trike that is shared with the wider Orchard Park community, a, very much a desire to reduce car usage if we can. And sitting behind it is the shared electric car, now one of three shared cars in the community, again, to try and reduce car ownership and to make when cars are used that more sustainable. And then on the right with the glorious panty bunting is our um, free table that goes out monthly before the remains go off to the charity shop uh, at, at, on the boundary of the community for anyone in the area including ourselves to have a rummage through. And then uh, this is my last slide, and this is about caring for others. And I think we'll pick this up in the conversation. Um, here, it's caring for chickens on the, on the um, right-hand side that are now roaming freely in the community. And then, and that sort of emphasis on uh, biodiversity and how we can support that is really important to the community. And then and on the right hand side is one of my neighbours who uh, during COVID decided to start a effectively providing meals on Tuesday lunchtimes to members of the community who wanted it um, because she was interested in learning how to cook at scale. Um, and I think that's and that was a very valued service during that period of time. So that, those are my, my um, images. And I'm now going to hand over to Meredith to talk about the journey that led to Marmalade Lane um, being occupied by residents. Meredith. 
Thanks, Francis. And I'm just going to see if I can. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I hope that gave you a flavor of um, what the place is like now. I mean, Marmalade Lane has been heavily um, published, um, published, so we were quite keen to give a sense of the occupation of it rather than the aesthetics of it. Um, and this idea of, um, I think it's easy to forget, to forget for us, certainly we've been involved in it for six years now, how um, rare it is to be a part of a, a process of designing a home. It's not a house, but homes uh, for yourself. And um, it's not to be underestimated the, the effect of being a part of both making a vision for a place that you, and participating in, in the process of making it happen happen you know it's a, it's a it's a long task but it's a very fruitful one and that has had a great bearing i think on how people feel about the places that they live and but it's a very very rare thing so we're working with a number of um co-housing groups or a couple that's um naga uh, associates at mole working with um suvana co-housing group they're still looking for a site um on a, a, a workshop and that's his group that um visiting marmalade lane at the bottom uh, on the right hand side at the top is uh, uh, a model that was used for a public consultation event uh, for a project that we're doing with town in Wolverton. Uh, and we're now working with Still Green uh, co-housing group um, in, in, in that process of co-design where we're in helping them to shape up um, in physical terms at what their ambitions are uh, as a brief. But uh, Marmalade Lane was, I mean, all co-housing um, seems to happen in a different way. There's no set model. And um, Marmalade Lane was uh, different to many in that we got involved actually as part of a competition once the process of co-design had already happened. Um, and the site was owned by Cambridge City Council. Uh, and it's part of um, the, the planning authority is South Cam's District Council. And South Cam's actually were given seed funding from central government to be a vanguard authority looking at self-build uh, and how they could promote it. And they gave seed funding to uh, the K1 housing uh, co-housing group to start the process of, of co-design before we got involved um, and and the, they had um, this site had been identified and the council had been petitioned to to use it as as um, a co-housing uh, project or reserve it for a co-housing project rather than selling it on the open market um, so there were others involved before us, Stephen uh, Hill and Adam Broadway helped both the both councils in understanding how that process could work and the finances of it could work. And they employed Cambridge Ar Architectural Research and Jim uh, and Katie to, to, to work with the group doing the co-housing, uh, sorry, doing the, the, the co-design uh, process, which took about a year. I mean, it was quite a long process and they engaged with the local authority in terms of planning. So when we got involved, it was actually um, relatively um, clearly defined. You can see there these early sketches that Jim had done where um, the Marmalade Lane itself was already established, the basic principles that have been covered from um, uh, previous speakers um, shown how they were going to work on that site. And then from this, a brief was, pr was, was produced. Now, the brief was given to developers to bid for the site. So actually, in some ways, it's a it's a commercial venture. Cambridge City Council said, OK, we're going to reverse re, reserve the site for a co-housing group uh, through the process of working with uh, Cambridge Architectural Research. We'll come up with a brief and then we're going to sell the site uh, to a developer who's going to develop it to that brief on a requirement that they uh, sell it to the co-housing group. Um, so there are, I think, four developers who came forward and were interested and put forward an initial um, expression of interest. And then a competition that was uh, initially based uh, on uh, the first round of it was initially based upon uh, assessing the quality with the co-housing group involved. Um, and then we had a process of exchange of um, uh, ideas and information and we were invited to develop it further come up, the developers coming up with a, a firm uh, uh, financial offer. And then the second round actually was being decided, weighted towards the financial offer. <clears throat> so that had a bearing on what we were able to, to do. Obviously, the um, uh, it, we had to um, think about the efficiencies of building in order to be able to offer the most money for the plot of land, which would go to the city council in order to win the competition 
Um, so part of our initial proposal was looking at the um, uh, both the, the, the planning uh, risk and the complexities in the initial draft scheme in the brief and seeing how we could uh, rationalize it to make a development that was likely to be cheaper to, to build and therefore be able to offer more money for the site. Um, so the process that we uh, came up with, that was the competition or the second round image that we produced, which is fixed at that point, the design uh, more or less without uh, any, uh, with well, some formal involvement with the co-housing group, group, but not a lot of co-design that went into this stage. It was basically interpreting the brief in order to come up with a solution. Um, and part of that was um, trying to uh, come up with a uh, series of uh, houses that had the same front to back dimension so that we could have a series of terraces and not knowing exactly who was going to be able to afford what housing type, um, but nevertheless be able to fit in a whole bunch of different variations into the final outcome. So that the, the orange being the wider, bigger houses, uh, the, the, the yellow being narrower, um, the, the, the turquoise being flats and the light blue being a, a walk up maisonette above a, a single person or a single bedroom apartment so it's a great deal of variation um and then and then of course the uh, common house in the center and um, other shared facilities that we might go into later on <clears throat> so having won the competition we had a chance to finally meet our clients and have a whole series of workshops um, in order to um, design the uh, project in much greater detail i must say that uh, the k1 uh, group who they were called then the marmalade Lane co-housing group, they're incredibly well organized and had a, a working group, uh, which then um, split up into individual work streams and worked with us at, as architects in evening meetings on individual aspects of the project in order to then feed back into um, their uh, joint working group and to the residents uh, as a whole um, and vote on various options, which then came back to us as decisions. <clears throat> Um, so that's the kind of, this is the, uh, some sketches that were the result of a working group on the common house itself, which you can see finally in, in use at the end. Um, so the principles, um, which you've, you've heard quite a lot about uh, in, in um, previous um, uh, presentations, but inclusive design. Uh, so the aspects of inclusive design, we were looking at how it could fit a wide range of, of, of families and um, um and also working on happy the uh, housing for the um aged population principles of um buildings that were easily accessible and had contact with the social spaces we'll, and i think we'll come back to the idea of inclusivity in terms of um uh, financial uh, ability to join a a group later on i'm sure we will um low carbon was um uh, uh, Francis is not part of co-housing UK principles, but it was part of our brief um, and we set a target in consultation with the group as to what measure they wanted to adopt, uh, given how much various measures were going to be. So from an initial brief of a passive house, the costs of that were ascertained and eventually we looked at what has become actually the low energy building standard as the passive house institute which is about 30 i think it's 35 or 38 kilowatt hours per meter squared so that was a target that we were looking at and also it's a it's a it's a wholly electric uh, development with um uh, both mbhr and air source heat pumps so that was something that was um derived through discussion with the group <laughs> um customization we knew from the outset that we were going to have to deal with with a lot of variation in um, expectation of, of housing sizes, but also more particularly um, variation from people that we had yet to meet that were going to be joining the group. So the idea of um, customization being built into the uh, project, which had to be kind of fixed in order to get planning. <clears throat> and uh, space to play, we've already heard that's part of the co-housing principles and Francis used the same slide to demonstrate that the cars are pushed to the edge of the site uh, instead of taking up most of it uh, on the adjoining plots. Um, so I've been through that fairly quickly in order to make time for que questions. Um, but the last slide just has uh, a list of the 
a number of people that were involved, which is has a flavour of the complexities uh, uh, to actually get the um, the project through planning and construction into occupation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis and and uh, Meredith. I have a great many questions. Marilyn, <laughs> probably you want to introduce our, or rem remind well, the audience of our questions. I mean, it would be nice just to, to kick off with a re returning to our three questions. And, and Francis and Meredith, if you don't think they're the right questions, you can take them in any direction you, you want. But um, so we, of course, are interested in the and the relationship between ambition and reality. So how do the actually existing um, co-housing developments um, succeed in, in integrating these goals that we've talked about? And also, and, the, I, sorry. Francis, you, you really didn't mention this. Uh, you mentioned a lot of activities with, uh, which are good for the environment. But how actually in Marmalade Lane are the, are the tasks being split up? And do you see a tendency for some kind of people doing rather this and, and other kind of people doing the other thing? Yes. Um, it's a really difficult question to answer because COVID has sort of interrupted the life of the community and changed how we've used spaces and so we've been living outside for so much of the time and one of the wonderful things about that is you don't have to vacuum um <laughs> so so it's actually quite difficult to answer and we're gradually using the internal spaces more and i'm ashamed to say that the answer to the question is about rotors is at the moment we are just waiting to see um how it works if we don't formalize it as much as we had previously um we have invested in a robot <laughs> to take on some of the labor involved in cleaning uh, the floor of the great hall and i think we're um, upgrading that as well um, and that was very much a decision made um by the group that is responsible for the common house and um which isn't entirely women um, interestingly, but um, no, no, but, but um, during the design process and also after, um, did you have the feeling that all the voices were being heard, or did you take any specific measures to ensure that also people who were, for example, not so digitally apt um, were being included in all the decisions? Can you say a bit about that? Uh, Francis, you were involved, weren't you, in the um, process post competition? Um, so, yes. from our perspective, and um, we, as I said before, the, um, the the group were very well organised. So we were kind of delivered people who were going to be taking responsibility for different aspects, and we'd work with five individuals, and they'd then go and report back. So, we were talking to the active ones. The extent to which be interesting to know to the extent to which the reporting back and the involvement at the other side of the fence worked but do you have you do you have the feeling that it's always the same people speaking up in such a process to a degree yes the process is an open process so anyone can get involved but i think a whole range of factors influence whether they can and i think in many ways for co-housing groups we're now involved with, where more of it is more of that design work is online, it's actually easier for a greater range of people to participate than when we were involved and we were having in-person meetings, which did limit people's attendance. Um, I think one of the voices that came through very strongly through um, the design phase was the needs of um, parents and children. Now, uh, um, and that was, you know, alongside that were also the needs of people who were aging and were thinking about what later life would look like. And they were two strong themes that came through the design process, I think. But that brings us, I think, Sherilyn, also to the second question, um, probably. Is it a role of an architect to 
mind this kind of things to pay attention to the fact that everybody is involved in the design uh, and and the engineering choices i i find in my consultancy that uh, it's very often very classical that the senior men are very absorbed in this technology and they all want to know and install the latest heat pump and and uh, or what have you low impact technology um and they are not so open to uh, low tech uh, technologies uh, or solutions probably but do you i then i wonder is it my role to mobilize uh, maybe also people who might have other visions or how do you see that meredith yeah it's interesting i mean so there's quite a lot of co-housing groups where the architect is part of it so much more integrated mm -hmm. and um i mean working with a, a number of them, we're definitely um, we're definitely at the service of the group. I think so. We, as professionals, we're making it clear what decisions need decisions need to be made when, um, in order to get from A to Z, um, and uh, assisting a conversation. But actually, who who we're having that conversation with on a given day. We're not in, we're not saying you you must organise yourselves in a certain way so we so we get a representative view. We're, we're accepting that the people that are coming to us, they've decided are a representative view, um, or are representatives. Um, and so far, I mean, we haven't had issues where decisions have been reversed or conversations that we've had have been muddied later on when we've realised that things weren't as we thought they were. So far, we've worked with people who have um, respected the fact that it's a iterative, but a, uh, but a, a consecutive process. And you, in order to go forward, you must make decisions and get to the next stage. So um, yeah, that's yeah. So I think we're, we're facilitators. Um, but we're not the we're not, we're not uh, calling the shots in how they organize themselves because they're people that you know are really keen on acting as a group and, mm -hmm. and we're respecting how they choose that to happen mm -hmm. and you focus more on uh, proposing different variations uh, for example in 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 housing typology i thought that uh, drawing of of the with the blue for the cars uh, is really brilliant because it it so much shows how what the impact that a design can have the design choices can have um, absolutely in I mean, organizing this kind of i mean uh, facilitating that at least potentially it could happen yeah i mean actually that drawing was done after the event uh, to show other, other local authorities um uh, the impact of what we're suggesting <clears throat> In that light, I was uh, I was wondering about the um, the role of the local authorities because somewhere, if I understood you correctly, you said uh, that we were able to offer more for the land. So does that mean that the land allocation was actually still price based? Yes, it was. I mean, the the value of the land on the open market um, would probably have been greater. And so the council, having decided to, oper uh, to offer the land only to a co-housing group, had already um, valued some of the land for its social value in order to be able to take it off the open market. So the value of the land is not just its financial value. They've already, already made a de decision to include social value by offering it to a, 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 a co-housing group. Well, that's having, exactly... Yeah. Sorry, yeah. But having done that, they then had a competition uh, for developers who would build the co-housing. Um, uh, and, and that was a, a financial offer. So the one who offered the most money, mm -hmm. as long as they fulfilled the threshold of quality that the um, co-housing group were happy with, mm -hmm. the one that offered the most money was going to um, get the, the land. Mm -hmm. Uh, th this is a uh, really a key element huh? that um, 
uh, we calculate this this kind of project uh, on the moment of sale and the price that they get on that moment and not on the long-term value that this kind of projects bring in urban qualities in maintaining services in uh, avoiding uh, avoid to to uh, having to to make use of public services and so on and so forth huh? so and and a question of whether it is affordable and who it, who can afford to, to live in this type of community um i know there's a, probably a difference between some european social housing approaches and what's of what's possible in the uk context and maybe it would be interesting to hear the device experience of, of say the Netherlands and and others around, other examples around Europe and and the UK uh, possibilities around affordability cost and and so forth yeah this issue of uh, how much money does the land and the housing need to uh, to produce is is really um, something that hangs over many projects and in the Netherlands for example uh, many projects in order to secure affordability work together with a housing association who who is then the co-client so the residents association and the housing association work together uh, to create the project and so you have part property and part uh, rental housing um, sometimes uh, subsidized uh, rental housing uh, but that is a very difficult process because it means that often for example the the residents have very much higher um, uh, sustainability um, ambitions than the the housing association because um, when the resident association takes um, decisions about uh, energy saving for example there is no split incentive they they have the direct benefit uh, the housing association does not uh, pay the energy bill so they don't notice the effects so um yeah uh, it it is a difficult process as long as we don't do land allocation based on the societal value of these projects. Mm. Um, then, yeah. I mean the good the good news is um, I mean so Marmalade Lane has no affordable housing and um, the, the the land was developed um, as a whole by the city council and the affordable housing had already been developed actually on the adjacent plot. Um, so there was no requirement for them to provide um, social housing, as they normally would be. So actually, it's a big issue in future co-housing projects. Um, if you have a plot of land, there's a requirement for local authority, you know, to conform with local authority legislation that you do provide affordable housing. And how's that going to happen? And and how's you know is that a complication too far? And the good news is that. I mean, we're talking to housing associations who want to do it, who recognise the value in doing in in um, in co-housing, and want to figure out how they can be a part of it. There's always going to be a tension, as you say, between ambitions and how much you spend on the fabric of the building and what your ecological value is, versus the capital funding that housing associations are going to be able to get from central government. That's a tension, but so maybe we can't have 100% of what we would like. But um, it, it, it doesn't preclude um, housing associations being a part of um, uh, the, the venture. And the ones that have actually, they reported that they, they have less management um, time with the residents who are part of a co-housing group than they do with their other residents. <laughs> so, you know, there's a, a bonus there for the uh, uh, housing associations that, that want to be a part of a venture. Yes, and there is much less uh, turnover, so there's mm -hmm. much uh, less costs in uh, maintenance there and in, in empty uh, houses and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, Francis, does that mean that in Marmalade Lane and uh, the, the the poor yeah, people the poor live people next door, door, and <laughs> and you you are a bunch of people with at least a very secure income, but also a little bit above average? In reality, yes. <laughs> It's a simple answer. We do have some homes that are rented out on a private basis, but we don't have affordable homes here. And it was part of the ambition of the group, but it wasn't the context for this site going forward, sadly. Yeah, yeah, and I, in my experience, Sherilyn, indeed, uh, this is much more uh, a systemic error, I would say, uh, in, in this process of land allocation and this thinking about how to finance and how quickly we need a turnover on uh, developments, on housing developments, 
um, that uh, that cause that excludes people. It's not that uh, the the residents want this want this in in uh, this experience. Mm. So you found in your study of European co-housing Midavai, that it's largely sort of white middle class people, professionals that are living in, in co-housing. Right? It's beginning to change, but it was definitely at the beginning of the of the movement mm -hmm. um, because you also need to, as you said before, you need to have a, a considerable social cultural capital you need to mm -hmm. find your way in very complex processes of mm -hmm. group dynamic finance um, legal aspects um, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then the design process if you have a good architect uh, mm -hmm. they will guide yeah. you through it but still yeah. it's very complex yeah. so i mean we're going to probably start thinking about audience questions in a minute but maybe we could come back to the question of gender equality um, and, um, you know, Francis sort of said something about you've got a robot to do the cleaning. So that I suppose the robot doesn't have a gender. But but what about things like sharing um, child care or other types of work that has tended to be seen as sort of a mother's role or, or women's role? Does that is there are, are there opportunities for having conversations about how that might be shared more? equally um is there a chance for children to to witness a, a negotiation of who's doing cleaning the cobwebs or or the toilets or the whatever i mean is does that create a culture maybe of greater collectivizing of that kind of work i it's again another really difficult question to answer but i think my sense is that it's fairly But if I walk into the kitchen, it will, it could be as all men or all women or a mixture of two. It's, it doesn't appear to be particularly gendered and childcare similarly, whether that's a byproduct of co-housing or, or actually um, who co-housing attracts, it's hard to say, isn't it? So it's difficult to... Um, I mean, this is why Lydia and I say we need longitudinal research on on, on all of this. And I, I'm particularly interested in in sort of as I said, what children are learning by growing up in these communities. I can hear we could hear children playing, and I think in your background, which is which is which seems really um, makes it a vibrant place, no doubt. But children, our children are, have space to play, and are they does for example is it has the space been designed so that people can can look out for children together or is it or still is it very very much much private? private no i think that's very very much part of how it's been designed that sense that um everybody is co-responsible whether it's for the chickens or the children mm. um and <laughs> it is playing out in front of your balcony or your windows and so I think that is, it is there. And I think you're right to identify that longitudinal studies are missing in co-housing. Um, and I think the other theme that is, I think on reflection interesting is that whilst the history of co-housing comes from a feminist impulse, it's perhaps not as visible now as an impulse. The sustainability is a really strong theme, but less so that feminist side. Mm -hmm. That, that's, that's beginning to, beginning to answer, answer a question, question that that's come from um, somebody in the audience um, named Adele. Uh, and she asks, in what way would you consider Marmalade Lane a feminist project? Now, I don't know if the, the question is um, addressed uniquely to you, Francis, but we could hear Sherilyn as well. Yes. Would you say, Francis, uh, would you feel you live in a feminist project? You're muted. Yeah, I don't think it's a conscious thing if I am. It's not something that is dis particularly discussed or is made explicit in the way that concerns around sustainability are. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in all its dimensions, human sustainability mm -hmm. as well. Mm 
but I'm really interested to hear the sort of <laughs> perspective on this. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, I, 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 you know, I'd have to have a, a visit to, to Marmalade Lane and, and do some research on it. But I think, I mean, I think it's, it's, um, I think it's probably much easier to assess and to point to features that are ecologically sustainable. I mean, there is the, the, the technological side, there's the, you can measure uh, throughput, energy use, water use, savings of all sorts. Um, but of course, gender and gender equality and social equality and how different types of inequality intersect is much harder to analyze. And and I suppose um, it does depend on people who live there and how what their values are and how they work together. So perhaps it's not a priority um, for the residents. Um, I don't think it necessarily has to be a declared, self-declared feminist project to, to, to match some of the, the principles and the kinds of values that we discussed earlier, right, the divide? Mm -hmm. And what would you say, Sherilyn, could be the role of the architect in, in this kind of project? What did you see in Marmalade Lane that you think, yes, that's feminist design? Well, I think what uh, Meredith was talking about, about co-design, I mean, anything that is more democratic and involves people in the conversation and maybe, of course, you know, I'm not saying decenters the professional, but allows, you know, that sort of maybe slightly more horizontal involvement of people who have their own expertise, their own interests, their own their own knowledge of how they use space, how they wish to use space and work in collaboration with with someone who can, you know, provide the advice. And that sounds like what, what happened and, and certainly what Meredith was talking about. Mm. Mm, but that's that really fits into another feminist line of criticism towards planning, right? Mm. Um, what is considered expertise? I mean, how long this this caring model of, of Blanca Valdivia that you showed us, huh? how long this caring is not being part of the uh, thinking about urban planning and it's just the high-end economy and the money-making economy that mm. uh, steers town planning. Mm. So in that sense, that um, the residents are on the table and uh, explaining what is dwelling and how do they want their house to be um, is already yeah. a step uh, in, the, in, in the feminist I, direction, it, I would say. I, I, think, I think it's a radical step. I think it's, it's, okay. it's easy to forget uh, just how unusual this project is in, in the context of how housing is provided in the UK context. I mean... You know, in terms of Adele's question, is it a feminist uh, project? In what way is it a feminist project? It has the capacity to be a, a feminist project in a way that virtually no housing does, where you're you're simply presented with the housing, you either take it or leave it. You have nothing to do with how it is. Mm -hmm. uh, this is as 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 self procured housing. There's a group who are actively involved in deciding how they want to live and then building it. So mm -hmm. you know if if someone has feminist ideas about how space should be organized, this is the only context within which it could be played out. Yeah, and you're not the beneficiary who is allowed on based of income or number of children, so many bedrooms and, and exactly. uh, of so many square meters and so on. I would really like to hear many more uh, experience from the audience, but there's also a question from the audience. Can I take it, Sherilyn? Shall I read it? Yeah, from Marie. Please yes. Yeah. Would you read it? Me? Okay, yes. Um, Marie says, um, could you give us an idea of how you financed the co-housing project? I think this is probably for both Mer uh, Francis and Meredith. Um, is it a uh, state slash council financial contribution through either land donation and or grants? Uh, is that essential? And, and, and really any advice? Um, Marie is actually trying to plan uh, a mixed tenure development. So advice on how is it financed? How can it be financed? Shall I say how say this works? And Francis, you'll give advice about other avenues. So this project um, was, as I said earlier, a developer-led uh, development. So the developer financed it um, entirely. Um, and I mean, 
it was slightly um it, it was slightly easier for them to do so, so it's because the council didn't expect payment up front they uh, delayed the payments until the houses were sold so it meant that they could attract smaller developers who um, were, were more able to or more likely to want to do this kind of project and then once the development had been built uh, with finance from the developer it was then sold in a very conventional way to individuals who bought their own property but by doing their building their own property uh, buying their own property they were also buying the freehold and a, and a percentage ownership of all of the common parts mm. so that's the only complication so in many ways in terms of the financing of this project it was a conventionally led by a developer and someone buys a house from a developer in the same way that you would anywhere else mm. but francis may have some advice on other forms you may be able to follow well i think um what i would really emphasize is where to go to for support and advice which is to your local community-led housing hub and um, to the co-housing network where you'll benefit from sort of the peer support there i think one of the things that i would reflect on is is the importance as a co-housing group in, is in staying flexible and quite pragmatic and taking the opportunities as they arise and um and being willing to compromise along the way because as meritive says they're still really rare in the uk and my own personal view is that we ought to be able to see co-housing as just an ordinary form of co-housing um across all of the sort of tenure types and development opportunities that exist and may i add may I quickly before we go to the question uh of uh andy um, may I just add that there are really interesting developments also going on in uh, community land trust, uh, which is a model in which the land uh, remains the property of a trust uh, and the housing can be developed and, uh, by a co-housing uh, group, for example, um, or others coming in. Um, and it means that you, you take the price out of the land out of the commercial market um, and it also means that you have two separate uh, funding agencies so that considerably increases the kind of possibilities that you uh, have and so that, the, i think andy's not quite ready to come on but that's sort of um there's a lot of planning issues too and changes in the planning legislation that has to be dealt with to make community land trusts um, more uh, accessible and, and common, don't you think? That's ideally what we want. We want all local authorities uh, to take on the idea that um, uh, different forms of providing housing uh, are going to be necessary to encourage in order to get our terrible housing market back on track in something like a workable solution. Mm -hmm and that um, uh, community-led housing projects are one of those. And then they're mm -hmm. really unlikely to happen without the intervention of local authorities. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of ways they could intervene, uh, mm -hmm. but trying to get traction with local authorities to get them to buy into the value, the social value mm -hmm. of projects mm -hmm. like Marmalade Lane mm -hmm. uh, is something that I think, you know, is really required mm -hmm. to yeah. make any big changes. Yeah. And we really need the lobbying to show that there's going to be so much gain and 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 benefit ecologically. So in meeting carbon reduction targets and so many benefits in dealing with the social care and the problems with the care crisis. I mean, we have an ecological crisis and a care crisis and co-housing could be such a huge solution to those, right? Yeah, don't forget the, the, the climate crisis and the mobility crisis. I mean, mm. we, we need this uh, mobility transition as well. And yeah. um, even there, we can have uh, new options open for us. Absolutely. Which is uh, where the longitudinal studies <laughs> are needed, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So Andy wants to come in with a question. Hi, thank Hi. you all so much for such a fantastic discussion. It's been so interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask, Francis has briefly touched on it, but I'm conscious that um, Cheryl and Alida, your paper uh, was published in 2019. Um, and how has the COVID pandemic, um, or you know, if it has changed at all, how has it changed your um, approach to co-housing as a commoning practice, especially when so much care work is now spent on um, physical distancing? 
Well, we all have to rethink everything because of COVID, don't we? <laughs> um, I mean, on the one on the one hand, I would say, I mean, I haven't thought your question about, you know, how do we work, like live together in COVID conditions, and that's an answer, that's something that Francis can talk to us about. But from what from where I've been looking in terms of policy and in terms of what people have been writing about and and really bringing to the fore is that COVID has identified. A, you know, and intensified the care crisis, right? That, that the system that we have for caring for people, whether it's health care, child care, social care, is not fit for purpose. And when we have a pandemic, it absolutely crumbles. So in many ways, you would think that if we build communities that are more, uh, that can facilitate and, and, and make caring for each other possible, you know, there's there's all kinds of mutual aid and things that people were doing informally, but this was be, in spite of the physical environment, not because of, right? Yeah. So the just it just highlights for me the, the 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 urgency that we need to get overcome some of these physical and regulatory barriers to make these things possible. But on the ground in an everyday life, living in a co-housing community in the, in a time of a pandemic, I do not know. So Francis, what was your experience? <laughs> um, I think it's a time when actually we were able to experience what we hoped for really, which was a community would be a much more resilient place to be at a time of a pandemic or whatever we face in the future. And I think that did that really did come out. And I think we also saw the degree to which people would support each other practically uh, through a, a very difficult time. Um, and and I think for children, it was a very positive experience as well for many of them, uh, because they got to experience something that um, extended periods of time together outside, which is something you, you don't really have do you and and so the relationships changed between the ages of the children and broke those barriers broke down during that period as well so i think whilst it was very difficult it was also very positive for the community in many ways and um yeah until it got too cold to be outside <laughs> Mm -hmm. That really that confirms really what I've seen in a lot of lot European of uh, developments, that um, there are two things. One, uh, the fact that it's not anonymous, so there is more social resilience, you could say. Um, and uh, the other thing is that, yes, there are some spaces available that can be this little escape that you need when you uh, need to urgently um, assist in a video conference, um, but your children are at home and they are not in school, and where can you park them? Um, it's just that little uh, extra room or the neighbors that can make uh, the difference there. Um, that's something that uh, is much easier than when you live in an isolated uh, um, isolated plot. There is one question in the in the chat that is really interesting me. So um, and we have very little time left. Um, are you all okay? Andy, is your question a little bit um, uh, answered? Um, it is. Thank you so much. Cover everything. That's really interesting. Thank you. Okay. Um, there is uh, there are several questions uh, being asked. Um, there's also a question to you, Francis. How do you organize the, the the project, and how much time do people have to spend, and how do you integrate a new residents? I think that's another big story that uh, we probably uh, can't address in the last minutes. Um, but there's also a question about a technical question about what is the percentage of energy impact that differ from the typical terrace house in the UK. Now that's also a question that you can't be uh, answering in, in two minutes, but I'm really happy that the question is being uh, raised because uh, that's a very big potential uh, where I think also women should be much more interested in, in co-housing. First, because it can save a lot of money and second, because it can have a really good uh, impact on the, the 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 health quality and the the the, the comfort of uh, the housing, um, and the 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 fact is, um, Francis already said co-housing is not uh, so big, uh, so widely distributed as yet. So we have very little uh, experience that we can really calculate with. Those calculations that have been made. 
clearly show that there is a very big reduction of footprint um, up to 20%. And that is because engineering these clusters can be so much more efficient than ed- engineering every single house and equipping them with the uh, single heating, single hot water system, uh, single ventilation system, and so on and so forth. So, Joe, I can't answer your question now, but please continue to think about it. Um, and uh, she continues to say, um, how differ the typical uh, terrace house from any, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure. Can you read that question, Sherilyn? I'm not well, sure. I, I completely um, I, mean, I, I don't I think the second, right. the second uh, yeah, part. Yeah. Out of time. Um, this, the, I mean, there was a question about how it's changed over, or, over time, like the big picture of maybe the last 150 years. Um, how has it changed? That's, you know, um, something that, uh, again, can't be really answered in the, in the final minutes, but I think that um, um, there's, a, there's also a question about whether co-housing spaces tend to practice vegetarian and vegan mm. lifestyles mm. Um, as a way of restructuring our relationship to nature. And I think the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we've we discovered that in our research too in, in the UK and the, the, the projects that we visited around the UK were um, having those conversations and definitely uh, vegan and or uh, vegetarian and very um, attuned to growing growing their own food and trying to buy in bulk and all the kinds of things that um, that definitely reduce the kind of impact from a food from diets right not just the work but also the the types of products that are being consumed uh, but I think it's time we need to wrap up. We do, yes. And there is one longitudinal study about this that uh, confirms that co-housing is a big learning experience in sustainability, at least. So, yes, I think we can see that there is a tendency, maybe not towards one solution or another, but uh, in awareness and and dealing with it. Yes, we are signaled that we need to wrap up. What a pity, because we have a really good um, uh, conversation going here. So... um, especially Meredith and Francis, uh, we want to thank you very much for your input, uh, both uh, as speakers and in this panel discussion. And uh, thanks to the audience also for your question and answer and for your interest in being there in the first place. Please uh, make use of the networking function if you have any more experience to to share, particularly um, how feminist is your own co-housing project or how can you ensure that your intended co-housing project is going to be uh, equally uh, successful in in equally dividing the the all the labor that needs to be done um i want to thank uh, the sponsors um, but i also want to thank molly chloe and richard who have been on the background and doing all the organizational work at riva um and Sherilyn, I want to thank you for making this cross-disciplinary collaboration so enriching. I think this was another good experience uh, with it. Um, if Always I'm fun. not mistaken, we'll get uh, a slide for the next Reba event now. Um, so have a nice evening, everybody. And uh, probably meet in the uh, networking uh, Um, chat facility box however you call it Uh, cheers everybody and uh, goodbye thanks for coming and thanks for the conversation i really enjoyed it